he does about a 10 to 15 minute uh, orientation to the program. Um, this program evolved, has kind of evolved out of several things. We have had a, we've been training study coordinators for a number of years, and we're now in the past, the past few years we've expanded. We have decided that we needed a basic course for the entire research team, which is what this is. It's a course to help hopefully keep you out of trouble uh, when you're getting started in research. We are, um, and right now Darty is passing out like a, an algorithm. I mean, it's an entire cadre of courses that we do offer, an explanation of them, but we wanted you all to have these. We did start um, in January in an investigator training program, which is four hours, and we're going to be repeating that in May. It is a program that is intended just for investigators, people who might be PIs or um, investigators. It's more in-depth than this, because this is just an overview. It's so the beginning, first step. We also do um, three, the three Thursdays of every month, the first, second, third, we do research seminars in this room. It's an hour. Um, if you look at the last page of this handout, the last two pages, it gives you an outline of what we've been doing, our topics and um, courses that we do offer. We try to have monthly themes, but I just, you know, this is for your reference. There's contact information on the front. Please do contact us if you have any questions. These are open to everyone. The only one that has a fee is the research training program, which is listed on the second page. It's the one that's for the entire research team, usually minus the investigators. It's how to implement the study. It's about 24 hours long, maybe actually 26 hours long, because we've increased it to seven sessions um, over a series of Tuesdays. Again, we will start that in April. If you're interested, let us know. And you will soon be seeing information about the investigators. I know we have some investigators in this room. Um, you will see some information in the next few weeks, hopefully about a date in May, when we will have just the intensive investigator training program. So let me go ahead and begin. And I just turned it off. Hang on a second. There has to, this is new equipment for us, so I apologize. All right, I'll use the keyboard. Again, this is um, a schematic that you do have in your, your handout. Um, the one thing, and I did look at everybody's training or everybody that was on my list, and the very top thing, the CITI, the GCP training and HSP training, nearly everybody has taken that. Thank you. This is just a very didactic uh, program, uh, programs that give you the basics of uh, research from, um, gosh, from a a regulatory standpoint. It's not operationalized. What we do in this class and actually in, in both of these is um, we provide guidance on how to operationalize your research, how to operationalize good clinical practices. We don't talk about how to write a protocol. We don't talk about how to get funding. There are other people on campus and especially here at the CCTS who will help you with that. But many times, if you're an investigator, what you find is once you get a protocol, then you have to implement it. And that's when the challenge begins. It's hard to get funding, but then darn, it's hard to, to get a study going and to keep it going and to remember all the parts and pieces. So this course is certainly the second one on here. Um, we call it the Research Orientation Program, and it's an overview of good clinical practices. Again, we'll talk about what you do, what roles and responsibilities will be required in a re implementing a research study, what do you do before you start a study, what do you do during and at the end. Again, consolidated into, um, consolidated into four hours. The biggest challenge I would tell you is I've been in research for 20 years. Every day I learn something new. Every day there's a new challenge. Sometimes it gets a little weary, but it does. That's kind of the way research is. It's evolving. It's dynamic. Not just the science, but the implementation of research. The requirements at the institutional level, requirements at the national level. Constantly, constantly changing. So, and just so you know, at this point in time, this is just offered for anybody who wants to take it. There is an expectation that over the next few years, 
training in GCPs, good clinical practices, which is what all of this is. Good clinical practices are best practices for implementing research. So you see another definition. Um, these may become mandated. There's a, a national movement toward increasing the quality, improving the quality, and guaranteeing the quality of research at institutions. So how do you do that? You start certifying everybody. You make investigators be certified. You make coordinators be certified. You make the regulatory people be certified. So what we're building here is kind of the framework that once the requirements come into place, we will have them, and then everybody will have the opportunity to be certified here at UAB. In addition to that national trend, just to let you know that um, in addition to the movement of improving the quality, Pharmaceutical companies in particular, and I, I would also say, because I do a lot of research with NIH, that the NIH is also looking at the quality at an institution, not just the science, but the quality of the implementation of research. There is a movement toward figuring out a way to grade institutions so that pharmaceutical companies will know that institution is good because A, they've got all this training, B, they have uh, the infrastructure that's necessary, they have the resources that are necessary, so you would ha your inst our institution or a institution might get a, a high score, which would mean we'd be really favorable for doing research. We have some studies with the NIH, and they, just as, as a point of reference, um, we've had some trouble, again, part of operationalizing is getting your budgets through and managing your funds. Um, they have told us that they are looking at that and that they will be grading institutions based on that. Now, Budgets and finances are really part of good GCPs because they are how we conduct it, how we keep the studies going. Nothing can be done for free. So anyhow, so NIH will also be looking at these metrics, and they already have started. As I mentioned before, um, we're going to provide, this whole program is to provide a very basic outline and the basic tools for implementing human subjects research. We're not going to talk about um, animal studies. We're not going to talk about preclinical studies. We will, you'll hear a lot of reference to clinical trials, because that's basically what we do. And, but that doesn't mean just drug studies. It doesn't mean just device studies. It also means behavioral research. The NIH, I will show you in a minute, has come up with a, their new definition of clinical trials includes behavioral trials. Anything that involves a human subject is actually what we're looking at. So although you'll hear a lot of references to drug studies, Please know that it imply, it really should apply to everything. I think the only thing different between um, drug studies and behavioral studies is that in drug studies you worry about drug accountability. But truly the rest, all of the other requirements, all the other GCP guidance are applicable to both kinds of studies. This four hours is not really a how-to. We're just going to give you some information because you're going to have to start learning. I mean, that, that's why one reason we have all of these courses. This is a beginning first step. Too many of us have started in research by just being hired and said, oh, yeah, just help me with this study and not having any idea how to do it. And um, we don't learn when we go to medical school. We don't learn when we get a nursing degree. There really aren't courses that teach you how to conduct, how to implement a clinical trial. Um, not in a focused manner. So, again, this is a first step in, in a long, and hopefully you will leave here with more questions and answers because I think you'll see that there are some things that are, that's a little bit more com complex than maybe you thought, but um, it is not insurmountable. So I think I've touched on all those others. This is the new definition of NIH that NIH has for clinical trials, and as you see, it um, interventions on health-related biomedical and behavioral outcomes. So clearly, this just came out a couple of years ago. So they've expanded the definition of clinical trials beyond drug studies and device studies. I won't read this. Sometimes our slides are rather dense, but this will be a point of reference for you. It just helps explain the definition a little bit better. You know, when you have a new research study, general flow, pretty simple. You're going to review the protocol, determine if you can do it, obtain contract, and have it executed, get IRB approval, implement it, maintain it, close it. Pretty simple. There are hundreds of thousands of steps between the beginning and the end of this. Um, and we'll try and describe a few of them to you. 
most important thing when you do implement when you do implement a research study is to know the rules. There are more rules out there than we can shake a stick at. Um, from International Conference on Harmonization, Good Clinical Practices, the ICHGCPs, IRB has rules. The, um, you might have an office which has standard operating procedures. You'll have guidance on how to do some of the research. Belmont Report gives guidance on human subjects protection, as does the Helsinki Accord. Your, our institution has requirements, um, Conflict of Interest Review Board, uh, compliance issues that are related to the university. And then outside of this, our little world, then industry has, every industry, every company will have different guidance on how they want you to do studies. Um, government also, they, every branch of the government has different guidance. The most important thing um, is to know your study and to know who's overseeing it. If you're doing an NIH study, they'll be able to give you guidance on what they expect you to do. Um, if it's an industry study, the sponsor will have their unique um, guidance. The, um, and the, mo the other thing that you will find, if you haven't already, there'll be conflicting guidance. Somebody will say, oh, you only need to report SAEs, serious adverse events, every um, once a week. And then you may have other, um, and I apologize for my phone, I have to, uh, my time is on here, so. Um, and I'm kind of watching for Dr. Solly, so excuse me if I look down at my phone. Um, there will be conflicting guidance, and so, as I was saying, the SAEs, maybe industry wants them once a week, every seven days after you've discovered an SAE, okay? The IRB wants it within 24 hours. You always have to adhere to the most rigorous. You can't say, well, industry only wants it once a week. You adhere to whoever has the most rigorous guidelines. So I hope in the, again, we've kind of done a quick overview and I'm sure I've lost a few of you through some of this language. I think acronyms are our biggest problem in research. We have more acronyms than, um, than anything. I remember having lunch one of the first times I, I just started working and I went to lunch with some other uh, coordinators and they were talking and I had no idea what they were talking about. There, it was just all alphabet soup. Um, so I hope, again, please raise your hand, please interrupt any of us this morning um, when we, um, as we go through the presentations. We all, we all know it's, some of this is not crystal clear. Defini so what we hope that you will gain before we finish today is understanding the definition of human subjects research, understanding the scope of protecting human subjects, and defining good clinical practices for conducting research. This is the basic definition of research, and how many of you have seen this before? It's a pretty solid definition that everybody uses. Um, two words are underlined, systematic and generalizable, because that's what, when we implement a study, these are the two most important things for us to remember. One study must be done exactly according to the protocol, according to the MOP, according to what the sponsor expects, so that when you do the study, if, there's, if it's a pharmaceutical study, the people in the next state who are doing the same study are doing it exactly the same way. You want to be as systematic and rigorous as you can. And, if, and beyond that, if it's an investigator-initiated study and you're doing it here at UAB and it's only you, the data that you're going to report, you want, to be, it, you want it to be to have been collected systematically so that you, you said what you were going to do and then you did it. So that's really, really critical. And those of us who are conducting, whether we're investigators, coordinators, regulatory staff, because I do think we may have some regulatory folks here and, and financial staff, again, doing everything exactly the same way is very important. And the whole point is to contribute to the generalizable knowledge. It's the whole point of research. We are going to do Whatever we do in research, it's going to be for, be for the public. It's going to be um, able to be shared to change the standard of practice or the, the care that, that people receive generally. The scope of protecting human subjects, again, it goes um, beyond, the, well, the most important thing that we have to remember is that safety comes first, no matter what kind of study you're doing. We must protect our subjects at all costs. And that will be clear when you submit your HSP, that will be, which is your human subjects for protocol to the IRB. Uh, when you write your protocol, you want to make sure that your human subjects are clearly protected. And when you interact with them. 
again, it begins, protecting subjects begins before the study starts when you're reviewing it. Are you going to be able to adhere to that protocol and meet the needs of your human, your subjects and protect them as well? Um, and all the way to the very end. So how do we protect them? And the design of a study with local IRB review um, defined safety measures. You know, what, what's in the protocol is the safety issues and adhering to those closely. Having a trained research staff is imperative. Who's responsible for protecting human subjects? Everyone on the research team, from the secretary to the person managing the budget to the regulatory people. If you think about it, why would a secretary possibly need to worry about protecting human subjects? She or he may be answering the phone. And if it's a human, if it's a subject, a study subject calling, there are issues of confidentiality, there are issues of what you should say or shouldn't say. So we feel strongly that this class in particular is appropriate for anybody involved in research because it's the basics. But um, there is nobody who should, in, who's involved, even the statistician, they need to understand the, the confidentiality of the data protecting human subjects. Um, we often think of protecting subjects more as a clinical aspect, but it's much more than that. There's a lot of emotional and psychological issues that need to be protected for human subjects. One of the issues that often comes up is, you know, so what's the difference between clinical care and research? We have this issue that we often call therapeutic misconception, where subjects don't realize they're in a research study. And this probably occurs more when you're doing a clinical trial with a drug, and you've got a doctor who's also a researcher. Um, so let me step, let's talk first of all about the difference between clinical care and uh, research. So clinical care is a, is a private activity. It's between in a physician and a patient, a nurse and a patient. The care of that patient can be decided between the patient and the doctor. It's, an, it's a very unique and a very private relationship, um, flexible, can, um, can change at any time. Research, we have subjects, we have participants, and the data, it's a public activity, which is kind of odd, because we're still going to protect their confidentiality, but the data they provide will become part of the public um, health guidance, the health uh, issues. And um, I think that it's real important to know the difference, so, so that when people are study subjects, they are just we're not taking care of them. I mean, we are, I mean, so I'm going to say this in a little extreme. We're taking care of them, but they are providing for us data, that, which is the most important thing that we need. In clinical care, the patient is, that is just about that patient. So it doesn't mean that in a research study you don't take care of your patient and protect them, but the data and what we do becomes generalizable. And you know we don't have a choice. That subject doesn't have a choice. They have a choice to stop participating, but they don't have a choice in the activities that they're going to participate in the study, unless the protocol's written that way. But generally, it's not. And it goes back to therapeutic misconception. Again, many times patients get confused when they're seeing their physician for clinical care. The physician asks them to be in a research study, and most people would would maybe participate because their doctor asked them to. And it may, they may be told it's a placebo-controlled trial. Most people never be, really, really believe that their doctor would give them a placebo. Um, so it, and it's, it, it's hard for patients to always understand the difference between clinical care and research when it's their physician doing both. So it's something to be aware of and to note and to um, try and pay attention to. Uh, again, it's confusing to the patients. As we said earlier, a uh, standard of care, it's a joint decision. Research is scripted, it's dynamic. And it's interesting, the, uh, the misconceptions that are out there. Um, some data that came, it's, it's several years old, but it's still pretty true, because I think most people, if you listen to the media, you know most people don't understand research. You hear about reports that are skewed, and they're skewed on the news because of the lack of understanding of research. As many as 70% of subjects in a wide variety of US clinical trials suffer from therapeutic misconception. They don't understand that their doctor is doing research on them. Um, they don't understand the difference between clinical care and research. So it behooves us as researchers to constantly educate our patients if they're our subjects. If they, because there's a key word, try and remember patients are when they're clinical care or subjects, it's when it's research. It, it behooves us to always be 
educating them every time they come in for a visit to educate them because we want them to fully understand they're in a research study. They can always pull out, they can always stop. That's always you know, their freedom, but um, it's important for them to know that. So the, I was in research for many years before I really grasped what GCPs were, good clinical practices. It was a term people threw around and it was like, what, what is that? It seemed very vague. The bottom line is, it's really just two things. It's best practices for protecting human subjects and collecting good data. Not one document, not the um, IRB, not any um, guidance from ICHGCPs, not the Code of Federal Regulations, speak to anything other than these two items. So if you're constantly, oh, you know, again, so compliance with GCPs is not really that hard as long as you remember these are the two, the two primary principles of GCPs. And I, you know, there's, there are, I did not bring one. Have you seen the GCP guidance documents? It's about four or five, well, it's probably several hundred pages. It's not really terribly big. And then the Code of Federal Regulations is the U.S. Um, description of, basically, they're basically the same in content and what they say. It's just that GCPs are a whole lot easier to read. I had started working with the NIH and one of the the chief of uh, the regulatory affairs department was talking about GCPs and you know how hers was worn out, the book was worn out because she was always using it. For years I didn't look, I said I understand it, I don't need to be looking those things up. After a while I figured out there's really value in being able to look at something and have confidence in what you're doing. So the guidance are, are very important. The impact of GCPs, they simply strengthen the ethical and scientific standards um, when, it, when adhered to and enhance the quality of human research that we do. Good clinical practices, again, where do they come from? Tragedies, just like laws. Any law we have, there was a car accident, so now you have to have a stop sign. You know, uh, don't speed. If you speed, you know, you, there's going to be an accident, so we're going to have and have speed limits on the road. So any regulation, any requirement does come from a tragedy or an event. And it's dynamic. It, they're constantly evolving. So an example would be with GCPs that just recently, within the past few years, is, has anybody heard of the support study? The support study took place here at UAB in um, probably it was started about 10 years ago, I think, and, and they finished about four or five years ago. But it didn't get into the press until about two years ago. So the situation was, and, and again, keep in mind that GCPs are guidance. So the IRB um, gives us guidance on how to protect human subjects, right? So they change policies periodically on how they to better protect human subjects. So back to the support study. So in the support study, they were trying to identify, so let me step back, clinical care for very young preemies when just after they're born is to put them on 85 to 95 percent oxygen saturation um, so that they because their lungs are undeveloped if you're not clinical that's kind of what happens um, and it helps them you know survive until they're a little bit older and then they come off the oxygen it was a standard of care there was never any research no research had ever been conducted but everybody followed the guidance between 85 and 95 percent oxygen saturation just they decided to do here at UAB uh, one of our key investigators, he's fantastic, decided he wrote a study funded by the NIH. He had 52 institutions across the country participating. And what they were going to do was randomize these preemies to 85 to 90 percent oxygen saturation or 90 to 95. It's totally within the realm of clinical care. There were papers written about how they got the IRB approvals and every, at that time there weren't, when they did this, the use of central IRBs wasn't prolific. So every one of these institutions, Harvard, Boston, San Francisco, major academic institutions, they all approved the protocol and the consent form. The IRB approved it, or, excuse me, and the NIH approved it. So it was, you know, one would have thought there would have been not one single problem with this protocol. They even talked about, uh, there was even a paper written about the consent that they developed over the, um, to prepare for this study. What happened was, two years after the study closed, somehow somebody got up, so a family got, was concerned because they felt they were not given full disclosure on the risks to their child. 
that if their child received 85 to 90 percent oxygen saturation, they maybe were more likely to die. And you hear the word maybe because we didn't know. And then um, 90 to 95, too much oxygen causes you to go blind. So one could say the parents weren't informed that 90 to 95 would um, percent oxygen saturation might cause blindness. So they felt they didn't get all the information they needed. The information was in the consent form, but it did not break it out into if you're in this arm, this is what might happen. If you're in this arm of the study, this is what might happen. So there was ended up, there was no lawsuit. Everything worked has worked out okay, though I, I do understand a couple of weeks ago there was a CBS broadcast about this and trying to make it sound like UAB had done something awful. But what has happened is the IRB now is requiring when they we do write a consent, it used to be that under the risk section, you would just put all the risks for being in the study. Now they want us to break them out. If you're in one arm, this is what might happen. If in, your, in another arm, this is what might happen. So again, just to show you how, again, that's a new, now that's, uh, I would say that's a GCP from our IRB, and I'm probably most of these other IRBs. And OHARP, the um, body, the entity that oversees the IRBs, is probably asking other institutions, you know, generally, has made that a policy. I'm not sure about that, but I know that UAB made a change. Um, but it's fascinating because just like with Tuskegee, we thought we were doing everything right. I mean, it, it, the way the culture was at the time, it was not necessarily considered a bad practice, but we learned and we made changes. The Code of Federal Regulations, as I mentioned, those are the regulations that that kind of dictate how the GCPs for conducting studies in the US. The ICH GCPs came out of um, actually a European or actually a global effort to try and harmonize the regulations by which we conduct research. That way, I mean, with the intent that if there was a research study in the UK, we wouldn't have to repeat it in the US because we know it would, we would know that it was done with good standards and good practices. Um, what happened was, we, I think the U.S. participated in the ICH GCP development, but we are Americans, and so although the other European countries have, have accepted ICH GCPs pretty much as law, we don't want to give up our code for federal regulations. Um, that's our law. I will tell you that they're very similar. There are some very small differences between the two, pretty in inconsequential. Um, so if, if you want to look at GCPs, looking at the ICH GCPs are probably will get you the information you need. You'll be well protected. They're just hard to read. I think the Code of Federal Regulations are written more legalistically. So anyhow, this is, these are better. Okay, and so back to the GCPs. There are really tiers and very many, and lots of levels. You know, you think the goal is to protect human subjects and collect accurate data. There are laws that, that guide us. Uh, there are regulations um, that are still mandatory requirements. Certainly the laws are things that might, if you break those, or the regulations, you can get fined or put in jail. Guidelines don't necessarily get you in jail, but they will maybe get you kicked out of doing research. Um, again, the Belmont Report, Declaration of Helsinki. If you've done the, um, the UAB, and I think everybody has, the CITI HSP training, it talks a lot about those two documents. But again, they're really GCPs. They give you guidance on how to collect data and how to protect human subjects. Other, so even on a, on a lower tier, the guidance documents um, that may be used, the sponsor may have guidance documents, the IRB has guidance documents, you may have office SOPs, information sheets, and then finally, training audits and compliance manuals. Those are uh, clearly, again, all of those will contribute to our GCP um, development and adherence. When are they implemented? Every step of the way, from designing, conducting, monitoring, auditing, uh, recording and analyzing, and finally reporting. Every step of the way, you want to make sure the data is clean and you're protecting human subjects, whether it's how you treat them, how you keep their confidentiality. Um, just basic principles, really not all that hard. In your handouts, you have what are called the 13 ICH GCP principles. They are, um, again, pretty standard. I mean, if you read them, they're not unlike, if you know anything of it, you'll hear about the 1572. Um, that is a document that investigators have to sign if they're doing drug studies. But it, again, it, everything flows together. We just tend to say things differently in all the different GCP documents that we have. 
So I think it's, as you're doing research, and you know, even if you're doing behavioral, I think sometimes behavioral might be easier because a lot of times you're in a different environment than the clinic setting. So it's not so hard to be assured that your patients know it's a research study and not clinical care. Um, the principles of GCPs, just the two main ones. There's not, you know, they're, they're very simple. Um, we make it complicated, but we always make everything complicated, I think. So the implementation of uh, GCPs is something that can easily be done. Does anybody have any questions? What areas does everyone work in? You know, I kind of jumped in thinking Dr. Solly would show up, and so he's not here. So uh, let's slow down just for a minute and catch up with you all. What divisions are you all in? Uh, departments? Pediatric chemo. You don't want to miss Okay. Has anybody been, is anybody brand new to research? The, um, I think this is, UAB is, is pretty, it has a very broad basis of research. There's just, in every pocket around campus does it a little bit differently. Um, one of my tasks is I oversee the clinical research support program where we provide support to investigators around campus should they not have enough staff to do a research study. And, um, you know, I would, I would tell you that everybody has the best intentions in the world. I, we've not met anyone who didn't want to do it right. I think sometimes we're not sure how to do it right, and we maybe learn how to do research from maybe the wrong people. Maybe not the wrong people, that's not fair to say, but in, in not, because historically we never taught research, how to do research. It was expected you would know. You know, you came out of medical school and you know, you we're going to do research. You know, great, you just did that on the side and it was covered. Um, regulations, because of all the events over the years, it has become more onerous. Um, it used to be that it, it always felt like regulatory was the biggest headache in research, but over the years, I have to admit, it's something I've come to appreciate. So you know, you've got your clinical aspect, and we'll, we'll talk about this throughout the, the other three uh, presentations, but you've got your clinical, you've got um, aspect of research or the interaction with subjects, you have your regulatory aspect of research, and then the financial. Every one of them are important. And you'll hear more about those as we, as we go through the, the morning. I'm going to run through some questions, and I can tell you all are a quiet group. There's more coffee if you want some. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, and just, there are bathrooms down the hall here, so if you were to go out the store, the bathrooms are down there, just in case anybody needs. Um, so the patient just talked, the PI just talked to a patient who, may, who met the entry criteria into a study that uh, you're working on, and the PI comes to you and says that the patient agreed to be in the study. Uh, when you approach the patient, she refuses. How is that handled? This, I have to tell you, this does happen more often than not. Has anybody seen this happen? And it's not for, <laughs> it's not for any, anybody's, it's not anybody's fault, so to speak. It's just that when you're a clinician, when you're a PI, you're just intent on, you know, you want, you want the best for your subject. And you wouldn't be doing the research study if you didn't think it was a good thing for the subject. Uh, but there's also the concept of the PI the doctor, uh, the person of authority. Um, of course they know, you know, of course you want to please a person in authority, so. What, what we, does anybody want to share what they might, have, might, might do in this situation? Let's say you're, you're not the PI for this particular one. What we would do is, well, and so what I would do is I would um, go talk to the PI. Because the, the patient's feeling coerced in their own, you know, it would seem they're feeling coerced. Um, because if they, if they tell you they don't want to be in the study, um, then obviously they were feeling uncomfortable with the PI. The other thing, Penny, is to, sorry, my mouth's full, is to give the patient the consent form a copy to take home. Because in those situations, they may feel pressure, they don't want to make a decision, and they can't. You know, and they may need to talk to family. That's good. That's good. Yeah, and so maybe that's sort of the compromise, too. That if you have the ability, and many times the IRB asks you to give people 24 to 48 hours to consent, and or maybe longer. And if the patient isn't, if they're conflicted, if you can possibly wait. There's some studies they can't wait. You know, they either get them now or, 
or you don't get them at all. But if you can wait, then that's truly the best thing to do. Because you want the, if, if they really understand why they're in the study, they're true, and they want to be in it, they're also going to be more compliant and adhere to the requirements of the trial. During which part of the study implementation do you worry about human subject safety and collecting the data? Um, yeah. For which kinds of studies with human subjects um, do good clinical practices apply? I misspelled word there. It's all. I mean, any kind of trial we're doing with a human subject. GCPs don't usually work apply to bench research. I would tell you that. I've not seen that take place. And good laboratory practices, maybe, but not GCP. Where might you find guidance on GCPs? Hmm? There are lots of, you know, the um, Helsinki Accord, just all the ones we talked about. The, again, I would recommend the ICH GCPs and making sure you have a copy. It's online as well, um, and then you can do a word search for the question you have. So that's a good thing. Um, any other questions? All right. Well, that's um, the end of that presentation. I think the next one is role, roles and responsibilities. And I don't have the time in front of me. Cindy, I'm going to have to find it. All right, so I've just been reminded I never introduced myself. I'm Penny Jester. <laughs> I just, you know, it's... It's like I, I worry about having enough time to get through all we do. Uh, I've been in research for about 20 years. I've been at, at UAB. My background's a nurse. And then I came to UAB, um, my master's in public health, and that's when I got sucked into research. Um, and I started out actually doing behavioral studies in the School of Public Health and then moved to the emergency department where we did some animal studies as well as human studies. Not all in the ED. We did go to the lab for the animal studies. Um, and that was really a great experience. Um, I worked for the Office of Clinical Research for a while as an assistant director and kind of started to become involved with education because I realized early on, I mean, I was a nurse and I went some, got my master's in public health, but I'll tell you, I had no idea how to do clinical trials. I understood the principles, but the conduct, conducting them was something that was foreign to me. So that's what really brought me into beginning, um, caused me to want to learn more about it. And, education and, and research and how to how to do it and then how to share it with other people. Worked for the GCRC as a research subject advocate for a few years and then I ended up in the collaborative antiviral study group over in pediatrics. It's a we didn't do just pediatric studies, we did adult studies and had about 90 we oversaw about 90 sites around the excuse me, 70 to 90 sites at different times around US, Canada, Sweden, and the UK. And I had to go to Sweden once a year for a while, so I was very sad. It was very tough. But <laughs> that money kind of went away. Though it was a fun, we were funded by the NIH, and it lasted for about 30 years. I wasn't there the whole time. But um, anyhow, funding, funding mechanisms changed. And now I, I pretty much do um, education, and I work with the Clinical Research Support Program. We also oversee IND, IDE development. I have a team that works on preparing those with assisting investigators in preparing that as well as clinicaltrials.gov. So if you do any research, you'll see my name fly by periodically. So we try to make sure that everybody's compliant at UAB with that. Um, so that's kind of, that's enough. <laughs> now we have to find Cindy here. Okay. What about is up close and personal? Yeah, it's, it's a little different than the last one. I'm going to, so I can't. Oh, I've got Darty's name, so I'm going to assume it's in there. No? All right. That's not it. That's, those are older slides. We can't have it. 